so th there, this is going to be a, a sort of data light, photograph um, heavy presentation, at least after the first 10 or 15 slides. Um, and I'm really excited to, to talk about the subject. It's using um, less costly, less um, yellow iron intensive techniques for stream restoration. This, this is a photograph of a, a BDA, um, a beaver dam analog, which is uh, not intended to be a permanent fix for stream restoration, but it's intended to sort of um, engage our furry friends, the beaver, to, to come into some of our headwater uh, watersheds and actually um, restore them the way they were before Europeans showed up on the continent. Um, when, you know, prior to European settlement, every stream that you've ever seen was um, an assemblage of ponds, <clears throat> excuse me, ponds and wetlands that were established and maintained by beaver. We never had, never had better fish or salmonid habitat, never had better bird habitat, never, never had um, better wetland distribution than at that time. And then we showed up and mucked up the works a little bit. And so where we have stream valley wetlands or stream valley parks, um, where we don't have a lot of improvements built in those um, places, we can seed control back to the natural system in, in terms of um, beaver and nature with uh, really terrific benefits to our water quality, to our aquatic and wetland habitat. Um, so that's where it starts. So, um, you know, we, we use rock in stream restoration as the fail-safe um, practice that gives us engineering certainty that what we're doing is going to be there after we're gone, even if, if it's only 10 or 30 years after we're gone. Um, a lot of our projects do include wood in the form of root wads, as you saw in the plenary session, you know, which really has a lot of value, um, creates a lot of habitat, provides some of the um, sediment protection goals that we typically use rock for. But root wads typically are used in um, combination with rock veins, as you heard, and, and other techniques. Um, tow wood is another approach, like the mud sill that you heard about in the plenary, where, where you peel back that um, vertical section of stream bank and lay in a lot of wood. Sometimes the wood projects out into the stream flow. A lot of times it's a, a pretty porous layer so that um, small fish and invertebrates and crayfish and um, sometimes larger fish can seek refuge in those areas. Then you, you place all that wood, you backfill it with soil, you plant trees into it, and now you have a, a more natural bank treatment. But oftentimes, again, there's a rock toe wall beneath it to protect the, that bank from lateral migration. So, so all these wood applications rely on rock structures because instead of, um, in a lot of cases, taking a systemic approach to restoration, which is let's look at what the problem is and figure out how we can solve the problem. So work with nature rather than put in a er erosion resistant material that um, you can calculate the shear stresses in your stream and you can size this particle so that you don't have to worry about the shear stresses transporting a rock out of the system. That's, that's not working with the energy of the system. That's, that's working almost at um, designing out of respect for that energy rather than why do we have that energy and how can we attenuate that energy. So that's what, what I'm going to be talking about a little bit, um, taking really a focus on more wood. This is a whole reach, and any engineer could have done this, right? Doesn't that look like an engineering solution? No, no, no insult to any engineers. I work with engineers, and, and some of them are the greatest people around. Um, but obviously, in terms of the surface area that we heard about, this isn't doing very much to increase the surface area of this stream bank. It's definitely going to fix the problem with stream bank migration as a result of this 
um, out of sync flow pattern, you know, where it's, you know, maybe there's, there's properties that are pushing it to that side of the stream valley. Um, it's not really solving the problem, but it's, it's solving the, the short term problem of, of channel adjustment and migration towards uh, infrastructure, but it's not fixing the problem with so much flow, so much velocity, such, you know, peak um, stormwater driven kind of behavior. I, I thought this was, uh, maybe we can flip the light off. Um, I mean, the one, the interesting application of wood here are these um, inverted trees, all right, which is terrific for bird habitat, um, not so much for, for things living in, the, in the, the water. But here's another application of wood. All right, it's supposed to be a joke, folks. <laughs> all, that, all the stakes holding all the coir matting. Um, this is tow wood, so this is a, you know, a bunch of trees, sort of like the, the root wads, except there's a lot more matrix back here, a lot of void space, so a lot of water behind those um, pieces of wood. And the idea is we've got this real big barrel culvert coming, directing the flow at it, and this can this scours a nice deep hole and stills the water, sort of attenuates some of that energy. So now, you know, you're you're causing a backwater effect, which is starting to work with with this um, peak discharge and this this greater shear stress and high flows. Um, <clears throat> Why well, push for wood? I, I this is a beautiful stream restoration project. Wouldn't you all agree? I mean. You don't have to worry about this until something happens to one of these gabion baskets and they all deform and start falling apart. Um, but really the amazing thing is that before Europeans showed up again, the, the beaver weren't putting boulders, 3,000 pound stones, to fix the stream. They were using wood and wood um, the tree roots were growing, holding a lot of the banks together. So that's really what we're about trying to emulate. Um, some of the things that wood does that, that rock can do as well, but um, we typically, rock has a, a fairly poor surface area to volume, whereas wood has a really terrific surface area to volume. There's a lot more surface area per volume of wood than there is rock. Um, so it, it, it provides a lot more roughness than rock. Um, you know, it, it holds a lot more organic material. So think about um, leaves, which is what the whole food chain of streams is um, founded on. That's where all the invertebrates are, are getting their food. That's where the fish are getting their food. Um, it increases a lot of the structure and the diversity of habitat. Um, so when you try to do, we just finished a 4,000 foot long stream restoration project using only wood harvested from on site. And when you, when you put forward that proposal, um, you get some pushback. And so this is the kind, of, um, the kind of considerations that we had to satisfactorily address to get permits from the core and the state and local government, um, all uh, sort of engineering intensive um, review, you know, the, the reality is that some trees are denser than others. Their, their water has a density of one and, and trees are like 0.5 to 0.7. Um, and then some trees also have this advantage of having um, chemicals like the cypress and um, Atlantic white cedar and locust that resist bacterial decomposition. But what's really amazing is when you, when you look at the difference between the, the kind of trees that dominate this site that we were working on, which were these three species, um, we had a, a regulator who wanted us to import white oak to the site, which would be like $8,000 a tractor trailer load. Um, and we're trying to get away from, from this sort of diesel intensive uh, construction project have a smaller footprint. The, the density of these trees is, is relatively immaterial once you're 
saturating them. Once, once that wood stays wet, it doesn't decompose. I mean, we got called up uh, about two decades ago when they were building the Baltimore Ravens Stadium because they were um, putting the footers in for this stadium and they were hitting wood. And the, the cypress that they were hitting still had the leaves intact and the bark. And so they were like all shook up and that was like 10,000 10, years old. And so that's when you take the oxygen out of the system, you know, this plant material lasts for a really long time. Um, the, the other, uh, I guess I'll steal the thunder from another slide. The other reality is that this is a, um, a building material that is continuing to grow on site and put its material into your project, whether it's in the form of leaf litter or a small limb drop, large limb drop, or just whole tree um, failure. One of the other big challenges that we heard about that we, were, we had to resolve was this idea of wood moves. And we were really lucky because the literature is, is pretty strong that if you have a small stream, um, you don't really transport logs. The logs, there's so many places for the logs to be um, impinged as, as it would move in, say, a 100-year flow that um, it really isn't an important consideration. On a large stream where the, the size of the log is small relative to the size of the stream, different story. So we have an office in the Pacific Northwest and they do a lot of stream, a lot of stream restoration using just wood. Um, and their wood has to be really intensively engineered, their, their engineered wood structures, so that they're not going to come apart. Um, they're not going to be transported downstream to clog culverts or to create other problems. So there's a lot more steel cabling, a lot more thread, threaded rod where you're, you're bolting trunks together to try to keep them in place. Um, we really don't have that problem in, in this kind of small stream or headwater stream uh, restoration. And, and buoyancy is um, an issue. You'd all think that the wood floats, but what's amazing is that the weight of the wood is typically more than sufficient to overcome the buoyancy of the wood. So not a very significant concern from a design perspective. Um, the advantages, it, it keeps on keeping on. As long as you're working in a forested stream valley and that's not going to change. You're not going to, to take that stream valley park out of existence. It's going to remain in a forest condition. We're going to continue to have organic material provided that's going to accrue in the stream channel. Um, all the, the the propagules, every time you have any kind of um, mineral soil deposit in the floodplain, those tree seeds are going to get in there, they're going to, to tie it up. So it's really um, a, a pretty um, regenerative approach, one of my favorite words. Uh, it doesn't matter how good a job we do when, when we build these things, when we step away, we're trusting that, that natural processes are going to come in and reinforce what we've done. That's not the way it works with rock or cement. When you build that thing with rock, if you don't have it built right, it's going to fail and it's not going to get self-organized back into a, a stable functioning structure. The wood, that will happen. That will continue to um, accrete, provide complexity in the stream flow, provide uh, increased roughness to slow down the flows, um, to deliver all of the functions that that we sort of taken out with colonization, with European colonization. So there's plenty of research, and this is a busy slide, but I just wanted to um, put it out there that there's there's hundreds, if not thousands of peer-reviewed scientific papers that focus on the, how fast wood rots, whether, whether 
debris blockages in streams accrete and what kind of rate they accrete at, how long it takes wood that's wetted and dried to decompose versus if something is in the stream channel, how long that's lived. So there's um, a lot of the work that, that we need to understand to be able to do this kind of design is already out there. It's, it's, it's free in the market. Um, and remarkable, but the, the Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Land Management have, have developed a design guideline. Now this is relatively new and it's, it's really West Coast centric, Pacific Northwest centric. But it's still, um, it was very uh, useful to, to the Baltimore District Corps of Engineers because when they saw, when they saw this, it, it gave those permit reviewers more latitude than they would have had if, if their logo wasn't on this document. So that's, that was really um, a, a, a big plus. So this is the story of Bacon Ridge, which is um, about a 4,300 foot long um, stream, a headwater stream. But what's remarkable is this uh, stream got its name Bacon Ridge because this was a, a land area that was used to stockpile live hogs for the Annapolis market um, during colonial periods. So there would be 50,000 um, hogs running around in the woods. So what that tells you is they pretty quickly killed all the trees. They pretty quickly rooted up any kind of plant that was growing that had a, a fibrous root system that the pigs could eat. And as a result of that, this watershed has the highest rate of head cutting of any watershed in the state of Maryland at about 180 head cuts a mile. So really, even though it has a very low impervious surface area, it has a real big problem with degradation and channel um, adjustment to flow. I mean, you can just look at all those fibrous roots and know that, that just a year ago, those roots were in soil. That's how fast erosion, erosion is happening in this system. Um, I have photos that go through some of this, but this is just to give you a, a, a once over on how these engineered wood structures are developed. First, um, there's two ways to approach it. One is these complex engineered wood structures like I talked about in the Pacific Northwest where you have to duck build them in place, you have to anchor them, you have to steel rod them together with you know three quarter inch bolts and all this kind of thing. Or you can put in a lot more structures that are all fairly simple and count on the redundancy because that's the way nature works, right? They're, it's not going to drop a tree in the stream and then drop another tree in the same place and then drop another tree at a 15 degree angle to those first two trees. And that's the way the engineers work. That's not the way the nature works. So, so we adopted this approach to put in a large number of relatively simple structures. And this is what the simple structures involve. Um, two trees, so we're talking about 12 to 16, 16 inch diameter trees, say a 30 foot log length, no roots on them, just, just the, the pole. Um, push it into the opposite bank and then push it down into the near bank um, so that it's three foot into the opposite bank and three foot into the near bank. Put, take another one and pull it into the near bank, three foot into the near bank, push it down into the opposite bank so you have um, a controlled flow path. So you're directing the flow through this engineered wood structure to be in the middle of the channel because you've just put these two, two control structures like this. Then upstream of those, you put in three trees. So these are trees that, again, 12 to 16 inch trees that we pull out of the ground with an excavator so their roots are intact. We, we cut them off eight foot above grade and, and use that material that we cut off for these kind of bowls. Invert the, the root wads and push them down into the bed of the channel so that they're flush with the bed of the channel and they, they project up, depending on the size of the tree, three or four foot. So now you have this very complex woody root system that 
is setting the new invert of the stream channel at a higher elevation. These, this stream that we'll be looking at is five to six foot in, um, incised, and we brought it up so it was within six inches of the top bank, the stream flow. Um, Did you fill in behind there or just let the stream do that? Um, we didn't fill the channel in, but we built this like a beaver would build it with layers of soil. So, so the, these are the, um, the structural elements, if you will. Now we have all this treetop, all these fine branches. So we're harvesting those, we're mashing those into the structure, putting them between the poles, putting them wherever there's a little gap, pack them down, put a layer cake of mud on them with the excavator, put more wood on top of that, pack it down, more mud. And, and the, the failure mode of these kind of structures in the literature it comes from three or four places. The, the most common failure mode is end around, where the, the stream flow comes down, it hits this structure, and it goes around. All right? And we've, we've minimized that risk by having those cross logs. So the, we have a, the deepest section of the stream flow is in the center of the stream. So that's where the greatest velocity is, rather than if you had a, a fairly horizontal element where all the, as the stage builds, it's just going over top of this horizontal element, that's where you end up getting the end around because the water all the way across that horizontal element has the same velocity, and over here it's touching soil. That's the weak link. So by, by putting those two structures in, we have a focus flow in the middle, so we've sort of taken that number one failure mode out. Um, the second failure mode is when when the water's coming to this point and it gets to here, so you've raised the water table, the, the stream invert four to five foot in this location. Now you have plunging flow on the downstream side of this wood structure that you put in, and that plunging flow can cause scour and it'll cause all this material to fall into that scour hole. So we build with, with the, the brush all the treetops that we have, which is a, a surplus material we build an apron. So you go from the top of your structure down to the invert of the stream channel up downstream of your structure with this, this woody brush that's also pancake with mud. So you basically have a ramp for the water to flow over top of. Now you'd say, well, that doesn't sound very safe, but we're putting these structures in every six inches of fall. So these structures, it's not like there's two foot of fall, there's six inches of fall, and, and these structures have a, a length as the stream flows of about 15 foot. And it's, it's all really cheap building material, free on site. So basically we get water flowing over the surface of that, so there's no plunging flow, which is also really important from a, a fish movement perspective or aquatic life movement perspective. You don't want to have this vertical break in the water surface. You want the water surface to have a continuous grade line, even if it's, if it's sloping, so that fish can swim up stream, or turtles, or, or what have you. Um, another common failure mode is um, piping through the structure, because what can potentially happen then is, if you have an opening that's like this big, this thing might work like a strainer. When you get a big rain event, you know, the, the structure will have more resistance to flow, so the water will build up. But once the rain stops, if you've got these um, big pipes, cavities going through your structure, the water will drop right down again. And now what you have is you have a series of plugs, partial plugs, that the fish can't get past. So to avoid that, plus it it can result in failure of the structure. Um, that's the notion of using all the treetops rather than just these big building elements. Um, you just pack it all with, with stems that are thinner than a pencil to your wrist thickness. And you just pack it down there with a, um, a big old excavator and then you're building this layer cake with mud. So there's, there's uh, virtually no opportunity 
for water to move at feet per second through your structure. It just hits the structure. It can move at you know, centimeters per hour through the structure, just like a beaver dam. But the net is that you got water that flows up to the elevation of the structure and then over top of the structure. So that's, that's the site. This is the general approach. Um, just another photograph to give you a feeling for how, how quickly, and again, this is five to six foot in size, um, you know, trees falling down all over the place, uh, you know, water setting up on the, the landscape at the, where the, the valley wall is coming down. This has a, a pretty nice um, floodplain, about 200 foot wide, but typically the stream is going from one valley wall to the other valley wall and just um, eroding multiple paths. So in some places we had two streams in the same 200 foot width that we had to, we had to work with these structures on both of those streams to get the water up. This is the nature of that forested floodplain. So this is our building material. All right, we're, we went out ahead of time, um, calculated the standing stock of wood, um, estimated how many trees it would take to build a structure, estimated how many structures we'd need, estimated how many trees we'd need, go back to the standing stock assessment of how many trees were out there and, and looked at the percentage. And so it looked like we were going to be harvesting about a third of the trees from, from this forested system, um, which was acceptable to everybody involved. If it had been 50 or 60%, we might not have gotten permits. There might have been a lot more pushback. Um, so this is just, uh, I'm a really not a very good photographer, but um, this, is, this is one of those 12 inch trees. This is the incised stream channel. This is the top of the bank. The excavator is just pushing that tree right down into the bottom of the stream channel and then into the side so that you're basically gonna have this kind of a structural feature lining the bottom of the channel and bringing the bottom of the channel up like this high, just by itself. This is what it looks like when it's constructed. So um, here's where the, those three root, rot, root wads, some of these cross sections took five trees, but this one took three. Across there, the crossing logs are located here, you know, high on this side, low on this side, low on this side, high on that side. Um, or maybe I just said that. Say again? This way. So then these posts, these are the only things that we imported. Um, they're northern white cedar, so they're rot resistant, they're very light, and they're straight, and they were all sharpened. Um, and they're like three dollars a piece. And you know, you can see like one, two, probably three, four, five, six, seven, so maybe 10 ac across the site, across the stream. And the idea of that is um, to hold all that material in place, all that loose um, brush that was packed down there, and also as more leaves come down to build um, a little retention system there to continue to build. And uh, this project started construction in October, towards the end of October of 2018. And we've already seen some of these structures accrete a foot. They've, uh, they've you know, because it was in the early fall, um, a lot of leaves accumulated in these structures and they, they grew. Um, one of these, Uh, let's see. Let me just look over here and see. I, one of them is a video just to give you a feeling for the... Uh, I guess not. Maybe the next one. Um, just reinforcing, you know, this guy's not quite six foot tall. He's standing in the stream channel. And this is after restoration, same general location. You know, basically... Now we have areas of the stream that are uh, four to six foot deep, um, which is terrific refugia habitat. One of the concerns with this channel was 
Um, it's about a 630 acre drainage area and the question was is it really a perennial stream? It's a, it's a swamp bottom but because it was deeply incised and because it's been incised for a long time the groundwater was exfiltrating at a pretty high rate so it was actually an intermittent to ephemeral hydrologic regime and the concern was well, you're putting wood in there in an ephemeral channel it's probably going to decompose pretty quickly and and you know my perspective was we're going to fix the groundwater drain problem here we're going to bring the water back up this is going to become a perennial flow channel um, <laughs> We haven't, it's been pretty wet in 2018 and it's still pretty early in 2019. And we just finished this project last Wednesday. So um, all, all pretty, pretty quick. But you know, uh, there is a question about whether we're filling the stream channel. This, this stream still has um, a lot of eroding channel above it. We weren't able to go all the way up to the top of the watershed with this project, but we were hopeful that we're going to do additional work in this watershed. But the point is that material is going to be con continue to be delivered to this system, so we're expecting that we're going to get more accretion of sediment in these systems as well as on the structures. Um, you know, just, just to, to give you a feeling for the size of those root lots, so when you push that thing into the stream bottom and you're putting three of those in, you're really, I mean, there's a lot of structure there. It's not rock but it's not rotting when it's under five foot of water and mud. Um, and, and this is sort of what it looks like. And, and all this wood that you're looking at here is this wood. It's all root material. So when you're, when you're doing this and you've got a 200 foot wide um, floodplain, one of the concerns is you're bringing this water up to the top of the stream channel, which means you're going to have increase the frequency of out-of-bank floods. This is a park system, Stream Valley Park System, so that's okay. There are no, no homes downstream, no, uh, no highways that, that this project is going to adversely impact. Obviously, an important consideration in, in project planning. But we still don't want to push this, this sort of the stormwater dominated flow out onto the floodplain where it can cut new channels. So periodically we would put in what's called the log sill from one side of the stream valley to the other side of the stream valley and tie it into our control structure, our, our log plugs or our engineered wood structures. So that the, if you do when you do put water out into the floodplain, and this is just showing a lot of um, chipped tree material, it hits this log and it, it backwaters. So now you have the whole floodplain getting wetted, and it also redirects. This is the easy flow path, so that's the flow path that has the velocity. This is after a, an out of bank event, after it was constructed. So you can see, and can anybody tell me what kind of tree that is just from looking at it? sycamore right so one of those one of those trees that the fish and wildlife service had opposed using because it was not a not an oak it wasn't as dense as an oak it's like you know 0.48 density as opposed to 0.68 for oak um, this is what that forested system looks like after construction so we've harvested all the trees that we're going to use. We build all the structures. We put a lot of logs, surplus wood that we couldn't use out on the floodplain to increase the roughness of the floodplain so that when we do buck the water out onto the floodplain and it's running through here, it, it slows every one of these structures is causing that water flow to slow down so it doesn't incise and cut a new channel. Um, so we're doing some some monitoring in the system. Um, the, the one element is with something like this, what we want to see is when we don't have a precipitation event, are these pools going to dewater? Are, are we going to have too porous of a, a structure so that it only is flowing over the surface when it rains? 
A little hard to know at this point because it's like a super wet year and we're in the wettest time of, of this year. Um, but one of the, that was one of our initial design concerns and I was just out in Spokane um, a couple of months ago and um, heard a, a researcher, surprisingly, she's a, a professor at Gonzaga and she's a PhD PE from Penn State and she's done stream restoration in this region and now she's out in the West Coast. So through a, a combination of hydraulic modeling and field measurements, she looked at 57 of these kind of structures and said that typically um, you're, you can expect 10 to 20 percent porosity. So, so we're holding back 90 to 80 percent of the stream flow in these pools. It has to get up and over top to escape. So that's, that was uh, pretty comforting. We were also comforted by as soon as we built these things, within a half hour, the water had filled this six foot deep channel and was flowing over top of the structures. But again, the wettest time of the year, the highest groundwater table time. Um, this is what happens when you walk away from the site for too long and the contractors are out there doing their thing. Um, obviously, this is, this is one of those logs, the crossed logs. And, but what we have basically is a fish blockage. And we have that plunging flow because they sort of forgot about the other 60 structures they built when they got to this one. So they had to tear it out and replace it. And, and this is the video. Let's hope it works. So that's, this is one of the constructed, you know, we're talking about it's 15 foot long, six inches of fall. Now, if you're a yellow perch, because this is an anadromous fish stream, this is the kind of, and, and what yellow perch like is they like to run up into these kind of woody places where they they put out their eggs, which are like a thin strand that suck up water and turn into a, a rope about an inch in diameter with eggs every couple of inches. So, so that's like, um, I just like that so much I'm going to play it again. <laughs> yeah. And you see all the leaf material, you see all the fine wood and and you see that a fish can make its way upstream because there's, there's such complexity of flow with those natural systems that if you have a really low flow, the flow is going to be concentrated in certain spots. If you have a really high flow, it's going to be spread out over a broader area, um, which is what fish have adapted to in terms of their upstream movement. These, um, these bypass channels or fish ladders and whatnot that, that take, you know, sometimes a very small fraction of the to total flow. And the idea is you have to have a, a concentrated flow to entrain fish to swim into that flow path so that they can find their way up over the dam. And that's why most of our engineered um, uh, fish structures have a performance of way less than 10%, sometimes less than 1%, like on the Susquehanna River. Very poor um, fish movement upstream of the dams. Oh, I could do this all day. <laughs> um, this is uh, an interesting, uh, this is an iron flock, so it's a bacterial growth because we, we raised the water table five to six foot, um, we have changed the local redox. So we have more iron being um, freed up as, as bioavailable, the bacteria. So this is, these are all little stems, little twigs. And, um, and you know, this, is, this is part of our, you know, there's a structure this is the, the sort of that ramp that I talked about so that it doesn't head cut. That's not going to last. A big, a big storm will wash all that away, and, and that's a, a bacterial mat. And it, at um, some point, and it really depends on um, groundwater flow rates, surface water flow rates, temperature, but uh, typically soil has an iron content of around 10% by, by weight. 
It's the most common metal um, in the soil. So we're not expecting that to be a, a persistent presence, but it's, you know, the, again, construction started in October. It finished the end of February. And, and so here's just some results. And um, this is uh, three wells, three piezometers across the floodplain. So one piezometer is in the stream, and we see this dramatic increase in the water surface elevation with restoration. Um, and then two of them were, one was um, about two meters off of the stream bank, and you see that pop up pretty quick, and one of them was about 100 foot away from the stream bank, and you see that one really wasn't affected because the inside stream channel didn't adversely affect the groundwater surface 100 foot away from the stream. It had a tremendous effect on the groundwater close to the stream, which is why you see so many weed trees and so many invasive species growing along stream banks because you lower the, the, the soil is no longer saturated. You have higher rates of nutrient remineralization, organic material from leaf litter and from whatever. Um, it's easier for that stuff to break down because there's more oxygen and the microbes have higher metabolic rates because there's more oxygen, so they can release more nutrients. Um, this is immediately downstream of the project. This is the depth of water in the stream. Here's the ground, the top of the bank. So you can see, you know, that the, at, uh, you know, 69 and a quarter is the bottom of the stream bank, so that's four foot. You know, that's where the, the water table is there, and then this is adjacent to the stream. So you see it's really much lower than it should be up here. Um, but because of the incised channel, it has this adverse effect on groundwater feeding the same process that we just talked about. So, so that's the 4,300 foot long project that was all, all wood. Now, Spa Creek is um, a project where we, we had our first application of these, these BDAs. We used about 10 of these beaver dam analogs which were constructed by hand and placed in the stream. Um, and I'll, I'll develop the story a little bit more as, as I show you the next few slides. Uh, the interesting thing about this project is a mile of stream draining the city of Annapolis, so 73% impervious surface, um, a square mile drainage area. So that's a lot of water coming out of that system pretty quick. So we removed two acres of Phragmites and restored it to intertidal marsh. Um, we fixed spa road so fish can swim back and forth. We restored 1,500 foot of channel through a, a, what used to be historically was a, a beaver wetland, but the beaver couldn't um, maintain their dams because every time it rained, you'd see such a, a peak in the, the water and had such shears it would blow their dam out. They'd get back in and they'd fix it again because that's what beaver do, 24-7, 365. They're out there working. But they couldn't really sort of put the second lid on or they couldn't expand because they were always just fixing their foundation dam. So we, we solved that problem. Um, and this 800-foot gabion basket um, project that the city of Annapolis was wringing their hands about. No, don't take out our gabion baskets. Lever gave in baskets. We love them. It cost a fortune to build, and they're failing. They're, you know, we saw we saw the tiny time capsules littered for a thousand foot downstream of the gave in basket reach because they were failing and they were washing downstream. So this is this is the outlet that, that squared mile drainage area, um, seventy three percent impervious. Let's see. Um, uh, I, you know, I, the reason this is oriented this way is because I put it that way. I should have put it sideways, but it's, um, the, the, the point is that uh, the contractor was sitting in this system pulling out the gabion basket reach, and it started raining. And before the contractor could even 
react to that. He had three foot of water coming up. Um, and it, uh, it actually has um, a sound track, but I, as poorly as I've managed to place this thing in there. Um, so he was, he was worried that it was actually going to transport his 90,000 pound machine, you know, and he didn't want to pay for that. Uh, but the point is, very peaky, um, high flow kind of scenario. So this is um, how we modified that cross section. The homes on either side of this were getting flooded with almost any significant rain. A one inch rain event, they had water in their backyard. They have no cellars. Um, so what we were able to do is more than double the capacity of this channel to handle that water because we took out the gabion basket, which had filled the channel, if you think about it, the 18, 18 inch thick layer of stone basket, stone filled basket. We took all that out, we widened it. This is what it looked like before. You can see it's, it's pretty narrow. Here's the, the top, here's people's property. And this is after restoration. So you've got you know, a lot more cross-sectional area for conveyance. So we've dramatically, I mean, we've calculated it, they'll, their yards will still flood on the 10-year storm, but it was, it was flooding on a one-inch storm beforehand. Um, and it's just basically converted what was a flume into a series of riffle grade control structures that force the water to fill up behind them, and then a series of pools. And then, um, again, it's 800 foot long. That's the pipe, and, and we're moving downstream. And this is what the stream downstream of the Gabion Basket Reach looked like. It was just you know, demolished. You know, you've got, you've got four foot eroded banks. This stuff is called acid sulfate soil, which is an old marine deposit that has a pH of like two and a half. So no aquatic life in this area because of that exposure of that material, all because of scour. This is what it looked like after restoration. We lowered the adjacent land area, sort of that legacy sediment removal approach, but we could only go so far because there are properties on both sides. Um, so this is the beaver story in the BDAs. You know, the, the beaver couldn't have a lodge in the water because, because of the um, stormwater dominated hydrology of the site. So they had a, a bank, um, you know, they, they move in through here and, and the ground is all hollowed out underneath of that and, and that's their, and I caught one of them. I can't tell you how many, how many motion activated photographs I had to go through because every time the wind blew, you know, the leaves would activate the camera to take a picture, but I did get, I did get one. This was the building material, um, live willow stakes and um, wattle material. And, and that's a constructed BDA and we installed 10 of them and in very short order, so there's some downstream of this and some upstream. This was a five foot deep U-shaped channel we installed these and the water came up right away and it, it wasn't because of all the leaf material being trapped. It was because of all the plastic bags and, and cup lids for like big gulps and things like that. But it still worked. Um, and this is just showing, this is the bottom one. When it was constructed, you know, you can see how sort of deeply incised the channel is and afterwards it's all backwatered. Um, so this is that channel that now has uh, 10 blockages built into it. So when the water does flow fast, thanks, um, it goes out here instead of continuing along that flow path. So now what's happened is the beaver have gone about 300 foot further down and built a large dam and backwatered all of this area. I was trying to get a drone flown before today, but I failed. This is the frag at the bottom end. Um, excavated 18 inches of soil that was established in Phragmites. Everybody familiar with Phragmites? Yeah, real problem in terms of the weed category. Um, 
So we exported 18 inches of that material, including the root material. The depth was determined based on mapping the depth of the roots, the Phragmites roots. Excavated all of those, imported a foot of sand, clean sand, and, and planted that in, um, you know, an, a, an array of native um, tidal marsh plants. And that's worked out pretty well. This is a above ground sewer, all the Phragmites. This is a, a large diameter sewer. The people from the Naval Academy run across it as part of their morning PT. This is after excavation. This is sort of forming the boundary condition for that placed sand. Um, but, but that's that sewer. And, and you could walk, before we took the frag out, you could stand on the sewer and the frag was still over your head. That's, it was really tall. Um, so we had a couple of years of pre and post construction data um, looking at a fairly small rain event, pre-restoration, post-restoration. The key to, that I draw your attention to is the difference between the upstream depth of water and the downstream depth of water. So you can see the upstream was very peaky and by the time it got downstream, and downstream is defined as um, the spa road uh, crossing, which is like just upstream from the tidal um, reach. It had the, all that surface area had, had helped to lower that peakiness. And, and post restoration, you know, it's, it's a, a little hard. We still see that peak, but um, that's on a small storm. Now, a big, this is not quite a 100 year discharge event, but we had a pre restoration and post restoration. And I think this one might have been closer to 26 hours than 24 hours. And you really can see we've sort of gotten rid of that peak, the upstream peak. The upstream and the downstream peak are, are pretty similar as opposed to what it was pre-restoration. So, you know, the idea of hydrology and hydraulic uh, metrics for successful restoration, I, I think, you know, people will say, well, Stream restoration isn't fixing water quality, and, and that's, that's true in great part as, as long as you don't think about all the erosion and all the degradation of water quality associated with erosion. But, but if you've got a, a chemical plant that's discharging to the stream, habitat restoration is not going to solve that problem. That, that requires some cultural um, changes. Um, but when you think about taking an urbanized watershed and through stream restoration moving it more towards like a pre-restoration good forest condition think about the value that brings to aquatic life and and ultimately I think to water quality that's really a, you know the fundamental kind of restoration so I, I think that's this is a project I was going to talk about but the government shut down so um, I don't have any good photos so we're just going to let that one slide any questions? I have a few minutes. These were the, the posts that we used. Yeah? How many years have you been doing these sorts of things? The, this is the first, first one for all wood. Because unfortunately, there's a lot of people who, when they see wood in the stream, they think they're being helpful and they're going to try to get it out. Yeah, like the Corps of Engineers know. among them. Yeah. Yeah, that's what my concern is about that. Yeah. Well, so, so you know, people are more sophisticated now than they were in the 50s. Um, you still got some boneheads out there, no doubt about it. But um, I, I, I think we, we're so much more respectful now of beaver than we were just 10 years ago. And there's still a lot of, you know, still a lot of folks that are killing beaver to protect trees. But um, I think the tide is rolling against that mindset. This is just making a point that these wood structures, this is in the Pacific Northwest, this is um, part of the Columbia River, and the idea is here, this is presenting resistance to flow, and every one of those is an engineered structure that's held together with steel rod, and some of them are buried 40 foot. Um, and really big difference, you know, a lot of stream restoration, has anybody heard of stream restoration? Fairfax County, Virginia, admittedly Virginia, 
is paying an average for th of $1,300 a foot for stream restoration. That's design and construction. And the project that I showed you, Bacon Ridge, was about $175 a foot for design, permitting, and construction. So really cost effective. And the, the 1,500 foot reach at Spa Creek that was built by hand was $800 worth of materials. You know, so you're talking about for a 1,500 foot, less than a dollar a foot. I appreciate your time.